see. Take time to be holy. Let him be thy guide. And run not before him. Whatever be time. In joy or in sorrow. Still follow thy love and look into Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive Beneath his control, thus led by his spirit to fountain of love, thus soon shall be fitted for service above. Amen. Amen, sis. Amen. Amen. Blessings on that song. And at this time, is Brother Henry on? Yes, my sister, I'm here. Blessings at the Sabbath. Intercessory prayer is yours. The next voice you'll hear would be Brother Mario Wallace introducing the speaker who will be uh, Matthew Westcar. Brother Westcar will be introduced by Brother Wallace. Go ahead, Brother Henry. Thank you, my sister. Uh, shall we... Brother Henry? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to include in your prayer, um, Nikaya, he was supposed to be on the program, but he was he's not feeling well. Nikaya Williamson. Okay, certainly will. Williamson. All right, thank you so much. Uh, somebody's mic is open. Seems to be at this Thank you. As much as possible, um, asking that we kneel. And um, if we're unable to do so, just have our mind in that focus in heavenward. Um, I'm going to ask us to take at least 10 seconds to silently in our hearts present to God whatever we want to put up now as we move forward to hear from him to his servant. 10 seconds and then I'll pray right after. Eternal, loving, kind, long-suffering, heavenly Father. It's just a few of the attributes that I am now afforded to mention of your matchless, eternal presence. I hasten, Lord, to praise you and to glorify you. Because you're awesome, God. But I even more so hasten, Lord, to ask you to remove, not just from me, but every one of us that is here, everything that is so much unlike. I want to thank you that you have kept us through another untried week. And you have brought us here to be refreshed. 
you have held us together by the power of your spirit as a family. A family who intend always to strive for the higher heights. So we will get up to the place where you need us to be. The image of God be renewed in us. Father, I believe without a doubt that you have answered our request because you said it in your word that before we even call, you will answer you do require that we call. So we have obeyed. We call upon your name and we seek your forgiveness and we accept that you have heard us. And so we glorify your name the more. We praise you. Yes, Lord, we are unworthy. But you see after and we thank you so much. So I want to present all the names, Lord, that we have on what we see as an extensive list. But to you it is. I want to present them to you. I want to present to you, Lord, your from your church for tomorrow, little Makaya Williams, and all the young ones, Lord, the church Makaya in a different way at this point because you know of what he is going through and continue, Lord, to strengthen his spirit. Pray the same, Lord, for every youngster within the CFMI platform and their parents. Lord, continue to bless their also. Father, you have presented to us today, like you have done many times before, your gift of forgiveness. And it come out this morning in a wonderful presentation by your woman's servant, Sister Lynn. I pray, dear Father, that you will hold on to these teachings, knowing that your human vessels are here to present, and as they present, we as humans need to keep in our hearts that it is sent by your Holy Spirit. So help us, Lord, because we cannot do it of ourselves, to accept your gift of and to demonstrate what you require of us. Father, the Sabbath school lesson was no less. They teach us of the selflessness of your son, Jesus. He suffered because he bored our sins. And I'm thankful that he himself tells us that he had not come to condemn us. But we know, because he points out who is the condemner, the author of sin. And we thank you even more, dear Father, that Jesus Christ is recorded in Hebrews 8 and verse 3, that he condemned sin in the flesh. Sin by Satan and its working in us was what are his root, or was what was there to separate us from Christ and from eternal God, you, eternally. But Christ bridged that gap. So Lord, I pray that as we suffer, we will see that it is the hands of God working in our life while we're being obedient and we suffer. It is your hands that is working on us like those precious diamonds and those precious stones to bring us back to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you and we praise you and we continually ask you for your Holy Spirit presence in our life as he binds us together in the spirit of truth, being the one who reproves us when we are wrong and give us the strength and the power to turn at his word. Oh Lord, we pray. You have prepared for us, Lord, your message and your messenger. 
And again, we praise you and we thank you. We still need that special anointing because each step of the way we go, Lord, each thought we take, we can just so waver away from you because we are nothing on our own. So we ask for your Holy Spirit anointing at this time and this whole congregation, Lord, present here on Zoom, live on YouTube, and for time to come that will listen to your message that you sent to the, your servant. No, you will not disappoint. We know that we'll hear your voice and that will cling to the cross and that as you feed us, we'll be fed because we'll accept what you have in store for us. It's my prayer thanksgiving in no other name but the one which under heaven men can be saved jesus christ our beloved redeemer amen 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 brother wallace you're up next Hello, can you hear me? I'm hearing you. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Good morning and uh, happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath, sir. I know that we all have been having a refreshing time thus far um, from all that was um, said um, through the health section and uh, Sabbath school and all. Uh, given the task to introduce to you um, the speaker, I would like to start by saying that he's a vibrant and a practical Christian young man who has recently come into the faith. You know, he has also taken much time out to drink from the well of water that springs up into life. He has uh, been in the faith for about roughly three and a half years, I would say. You know, he's not a stranger to many of us here local, but for those abroad, of course. He's a married man to wife, Mrs. Roxon Westar, of which the Lord has blessed them with a little daughter, which many of us do know. I do pray and hope that you will keep a prayer in your hearts for him as he shares what the Lord has placed on his heart for us today. Brothers and sisters, I introduce to you Brother Matthew Westcar. I pray that you will grant him your undivided attention. All right, happy Sabbath. So, good afternoon and happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Matthew Westcar. That's my brother Westcar. 
as Brother Barry. Happy Sabbath, sir. Yes. Now, I want to thank the Lord, first of all, for the opportunity for another blessed Sabbath day. I want to thank the pastors and the various um, ministers here on this platform, um, all the members of CFMI, also that's on this Zoom platform and even on the YouTube platform as well. So I really thank you all for having me. It is a pleasure. It is an honor. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity to share what the Lord has laid upon my heart today. So with that in mind, we'll just whisper a short word of prayer um, before we open the scriptures. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your words. We thank you, dear Father, for all that you have done for us and the varied mercies throughout the week bringing us to another blessed Sabbath day, a day in which you seek to draw especially close unto your children. And dear Father, as the word is supposed to go forth, I pray that I will be hid behind the cross, that self will not be seen. For dear Father, uh, we are nothing, we are but dust. But dear Father, your words is from eternity to eternity. And we ask, dear Father, that that word will be seen and exalted and lifted up to its appropriate place, we pray. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Okay, so we want to begin in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter four. And when we're there, amen. Ephesians chapter four. And we're going to begin in verse 10. And when we're there, amen. Amen. And it reads... Can I get a few more amens? Are we all there? Amen. 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 Awesome. So it says, He that ascended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, what we want to embark upon today is to look closer at the unity of the faith. Now, this must be something you'd have heard before and um, expounded upon in many different ways. But by God's grace, I believe as we go over this ground, we'll discover freshness. And because the word of God really is like a spring that is always springing up and it's always new and it's always imparting its life-giving vigor as we go through it. So what we want to look at is this unity of the faith. For those who are taking notes, that's what we'll be taking on, that's what we'll be looking at today. The unity of the faith. Um, what we want to dive into now is what we want to find out what is this unity like and what is the result of this unity? Just a little bit so we can understand the importance of this unity. I want us to go with me now to Psalms 133. Psalms 133, and we're going to go from verse 1 to verse 3. And when we're there, amen. amen. Psalms 133, from verse 1 to 3. And it says, A song of degrees of David. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. As a dew of Hermon and as a dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So then, this unity is likened unto two things here in Psalms 133. One is likened unto a particular oil that went down, that anointed Aaron, and it is also likened unto the dew. 
now, especially the dew that descended upon Mount Zion. Now, the question then is, what was this oil that this oil that Aaron was anointed with? So what to go to Exodus chapter 29? Just take a look at it. Exodus chapter 29, and we're going to go from verse 5 through to verse 7. Are we there? Amen. Exodus chapter 29 from 5 Amen. to 7. Amen. And remember, we're taking, at the taking a look at the unity of the faith. We see it's likened unto two things. The first of which, of which was the oil that anointed Aaron. So now take a look now. So Exodus chapter 29 from 5 to 7. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and garments with a curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. And then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. So then this oil was for the purpose of pouring upon his head and to anoint him. Now, symbolically, what does this oil represent? Because obviously this is symbolic. So, well, this here that took place was literal. But now, as it's now likened unto what when the brethren is in unity, what is it representing for us here? So go with me to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. What is this oil a symbol of? What does it represent here for us towards the end of this world? Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. And when you're there, amen. Isaiah amen. chapter 61 and verse 1. Looking at what anoints, this anointing oil. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good things unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So we see here that it is the Spirit of God that anoints. See that clearly. Now, let's get another place. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We're going to go from verse 37 to 38. Acts chapter 10 from verse 37 to 38. So when you're there, amen. 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 So thus it says, that word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Again, we see that it is the Holy Spirit that anoints. It's the Holy Spirit then is that symbol. So then, the oil is that symbol, I should say, of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, interestingly, when Christ, um, after he was anointed by the Spirit, on the banks of Jordan, after his baptism, what we see here, he went into the wilderness and he went back after his experience of temptation in the wilderness. He went back to Nazareth and the synagogue there. He quoted the very same scripture of Isaiah chapter 61 in relation to himself. So indeed we see, and it's very clear that the baptism that at the baptism of Christ, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and that that Holy Spirit is what that oil symbolized. Okay, and so when we think about um, Psalms 133, and it says, uh, comparing that unity to the oil that ran down um, Aaron, that ran down the garments and the beard of Aaron, then we understand that that unity has something to do with the Holy Spirit, or it's, it's some way related to the Holy Spirit, at least so far throughout our study. That's what we have seen. So then, the next symbol there, and we're going to bring it all together, is it is as a dew of Hermon, and that dew that descends upon the mountains of Zion. So it's like unto dew. 
But then, before we look at the dew, once it, it says it descends upon the mountains of Zion. So I want to find out what are these mountains of Zion? What this mountain of Zion, what is it? So to find that out, we have to go and go to Isaiah chapter two. Isaiah chapter two. And we're going to begin in verse two. Isaiah chapter two, beginning in verse two. And when we're there, amen. So we're looking at the dew. Okay, that's an amen. So we're looking at the dew. It's dew of Hermon, this dew that falls upon the mountains of Zion. We want to figure out what are these mountains? What is this mountain of Zion? A symbol of verse two. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the mountains of Zion, these mountains is where the house of the God, house of God is. It is the house of God. But what is the house of God? Because in that time period, we know that was where the earth the sanctuary was. And that was the place where the sanctuary was. But then what does the house of God symbolize in the Christian dispensation? Go with me now to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3, well be known scripture. Verse 15. And when we're there, amen. And brothers and sisters, if I may be going too fast or speaking fast, you can let me know. So I slow down. Okay. So 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. When we're there, amen. Amen. It says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the true. So the house of God is symbolic of the church of God. And this church has pillars and ground it has a ground of the truth and interestingly that word for ground um, for those interested in greek and hebrew i'm not i'm sure if i'm going to pronounce this correctly but it's hedra yama which means supports that is a basis or the base of something and so it is has pillars and it has foundations groundwork that which is based upon so this church um, this house of God, this church of the living God is a church with foundations and pillars. So it is as the dew, the unity is described as a dew that descends upon the church of God. So then, what is this dew? And what is this dew symbolic of? I want to look now at a few scriptures and show um, some what we call synonymous terms or terms that mean the same thing. So I want to just take, a, take some time and just get an idea of what exactly we're talking about here. So go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Again, well-known scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1 and 2. Taking a look at this dew that descends upon the church of God. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1 to 2. When you're there, amen. Amen. It says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. And so, what we look on to look at now is just this association here. Now, obviously, Moses now describing the word of God as dropping upon these people as the dew. 
But then we see that the dew is associated with the rain and it's also called a small rain and the showers. So you have the dew and the rain or the small rain and the showers. Now if you find another association like this, now let's go to Joel chapter two, Joel chapter two, verse 23. Joel chapter two, verse 23. And when we're there, amen. Can you please repeat this passage more than once, sir? Thank you. Okay. Blessing. Joel. Thank you. So, thanks for the feedback. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. And when we're there, amen. Amen. Um. It says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And all of these associations that we have seen now, so you pick up another association, it's a former rain associated with the latter rain. So we have the dew, that's the rain, we have the small rain, we have the showers, we have the former rain and we have the latter rain. And we know, of course, um, as Adventists, that it is a symbolic of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, first in measure and then without measure. OK, so we see this. We can see this very clearly. Now, what we want to do is to go back to the experience of the disciples a little bit so we can see exactly how this ties into unity, because the Holy Spirit, the oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The dew is a symbol of the former rain. What this has to do with unity? Why would the psalmist David say that the unity of the brethren and when brethren are dwelling together in unity, it is lighting it unto the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Why is this so? so? Let's go now to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And we're going to begin in verse 21. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 21. And when we're there, amen. So we're looking at this. This Holy Ghost being poured out. We're looking at what this has to do with this unity. Why is it lightened that way? Why does the psalmist do this? Amen. All right. So it says in verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, interestingly, so we're seeing that they indeed received the Holy Spirit at this point. But we know it couldn't be the full outpouring because afterward he would have then told them to wait on the promise of the Father. And indeed in Acts chapter 2, we see that the Holy Spirit was poured out that was accompanied by all the different gifts that were manifested on that day. So then, this then, what we see here is a type of the former rain experience. But what was the purpose of this rain? If you look at the parallel scripture of this in John chapter 20, the parallel experience in Luke chapter 24, picking up the same line of scripture, you will see something very interesting. Luke chapter 24, and we're going to begin in verse 44. Luke chapter 24, and we're beginning in verse 44. It's very interesting, picking up the same thought. And you can take a look at um, verse 19 of John chapter 20, and Luke 24, verse 36, to see that it's exactly the same thought. It's exactly the same experience, just but, but the experiences in, from the different authors are written in different ways to give us more light. So notice now in verse 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. 
then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them thus it is written and thus it behooved christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day so notice here what we are seeing is in this parallel scripture instead of saying that he said receive the holy spirit he's now saying he's now opening the mind of the disciples that they may understand the scripture so we see there is a definite relation between the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in measure and the opening of the mind of God's people to understanding the scripture. And we then there's another thing that's very important for us to understand then. What was this only for them to understand the scriptures? Let's think about that. Was it only to gain an intellectual understanding? But if we go to Acts chapter two, Go to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 1. I noticed something very interesting. Because when that day of Pentecost was fully come, that experience, the early rain experience, God had opened their mind for them to understand the scriptures. There was a condition that was reached, and then the Holy Spirit could be poured out. Acts chapter 2, going to begin. In verse one, and it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, this being in one accord, does the Bible expound upon this principle for us? We want to understand what exactly was this state of mind? What exactly was this, this being on one accord? What was happening here? What was the state of mind and the relationship between the brethren that were assembled in that room? What was it? Go with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter two gives us a very, a good exposition upon this point. Philippians chapter two, we're gonna begin in verse one. And notice what was the conditions reached by the disciples so that Christ could pour out his Holy Spirit without measure upon them. Philippians chapter two and verse one. And we're there, amen. And it says, so it's on the screen, so we can read. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now that is very interesting. So you have to be like-minded, having the same love, and being on one accord, and having the same mind. So this was the experience of the disciples before Christ could have poured out the Holy Spirit without measure. They were minds were open, they were understanding scripture. In Acts chapter 1, we see Peter realizing the fate of Judas was predicted by the psalmist. So they were experiencing this increase in knowledge, but then the experience of being purified, made white, and tried had to come as well. And they had to be in unity with their brethren before the Holy Spirit could be poured out without measure. Let's continue in Philippians chapter 2. Let's look at verse 3. Notice as it's continuing. Continue. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And this was truly exemplified in the life of Christ himself. Remember, even in that experience when they were there and they were to wash, Christ now was there with them and they were to wash one another's feet. Christ had to take the lead in that and it's interesting, if you read the spirit of prophecies, account on that, they were there, they, were not, they didn't have that humility. And even though the cross was just before them, that great disappointment that they had to endure was just before them, there was strife for the supremacy among the professed people of God. There was this strife of vain glory, but Christ had to show them the true principle of the kingdom. It was not selfishness, but it was self-abnegation. 
It was selflessness, the bearing of self, the exact opposite of the principle of what Satan um, came to indulge that causes fall from heaven. Because he said he would exalt his throne above the stars of God, while Christ himself take on the form of a servant and be made equal to fallen humanity. It's not even just fallen Adam, but fallen humanity as it continued to fall throughout all the ages until he came on earth, which was a very wretched state of being. So then, this is the principle of Christ. So notice as we continue, verse four, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so when you say we have to be like-minded, we have to be of one mind, the mind that the people of God will have to have is the mind of Christ. And how does um, Paul continue to describe the mind of Christ here? Notice it says, verse six, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself as no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashion, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That was the mind of Christ. He had the highest position in the heavens. He had the highest position beside his father. There was none, all the angels adored him, willing to do his bidding. And he took off all of that and laid all of that aside and came upon this earth and walked the road to Calvary. And if that state of mind of selflessness and self-sacrifice can then be obtained by the followers of Christ, then indeed we'll be like-minded in one accord, in figuratively, one place and indeed the holy spirit can be poured out without measure verily as it was on the day of pentecost and as we look this state of things is a state that christ prayed for we're going to go there to john chapter 17 john chapter 17 And when we're there, amen, John chapter 17, and we're going to begin in verse 18. I'm going to begin in verse 18 for context. And let's see, this state where God's people is in one mind, have one mind, all having the mind of Christ and being one with each other is something that Christ earnestly prayed for. Notice it says, John chapter 17, verse 18, and it says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So notice the unity that exists within the Godhead itself is a unity Christ desires for his church. And we can ask the question, does the Godhead contradict one another? Does the Holy Spirit speak a word separate from Christ? Or does, the Father, or does Christ speak something that's separate from the Father? No. That unity that exists within the Godhead is the unity God desires for us here on this world. Notice verse 23. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with, with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world O righteous father the world has not known thee but i have known thee and these have known that thou hast sent me and i have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherein thou hast loved me may be in them and i in them very interesting that god desired them to see his glory 
And the fact remains that he allowed them, he has declared his name unto them. And if we do go to Exodus, um, Exodus chapter 33 and chapter 34, we're not going to go there now, but we I think we are very familiar with these scriptures when Moses desired to see the glory of God and God says he's going to declare his name and then God went ahead and declared his character to them. That name, that glory, it was a character of God that he saw and then he bow down and worship and for us to manifest that character we must behold that character in christ behold his self-sacrifice behold his unity with the father he never supported the bones of that his father set for him and then now we can be transformed into that image from glory to glory now this unity is not something we can just passively believe it will happen and fall in place. It's not a passive process. Just like anything in salvation, it's an active process. I want to take a look at it. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, where we started. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to begin in verse 1. So Ephesians chapter 4, where we started, we're beginning in verse 1. When we're there, amen. Amen. It says. Amen. Uh, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherein ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. No, not that I'm big on Hebrew, but I'm going to give a little uh, Greek and Hebrew. I'm going to give a little again. That Greek word there is padazo, which means to use speed, to make effort, to be prompt, to be earnest, to give diligence and labor. So when it says endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit, we can't just say, well, eventually the watchman will see eye to eye upon the walls of Zion. We can't just say that. We have to put in earnest, persevering effort to achieve that unity. It's very interesting. Earlier, the sister was speaking of forgiveness. And believe you me, brethren, there is so much bitterness sometimes, even among professed present truth, about things that has happened in the past. Brethren, we really have to learn how to forgive and to let things go. Because without which that unity that Christ prayed for, that unity that is a prerequisite for the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit cannot happen. We must, brethren, be in one accord. We must earnestly strive for that unity. So whatever the injury is that happened in the past, God, we know that it isn't easy. We know that it's within our human strength alone. We cannot do it. But with God, all things are possible. And no matter how unlikely it may seem, because from the human perspective, it doesn't seem possible throughout the varying warring factions of present truth or even within the structure of the various factions of war in Christianity worldwide. It doesn't seem that the people of God will achieve that liberty, but with a prophetic eye, and we realize this is the promise of God. And we're going to see, we're going to go through some scriptures and show that this is a promise of God, that unity can be achieved. Okay, now let's go back to where we started, Ephesians chapter 4, we're supposed to be there, um, skip down to chapter 11, back to chapter, well, chapter 12, let's begin at back at chapter 12, as we start to bring this to a close, sorry, come verse 12, verse 12, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, my mistake, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, and it says, well, might as well start at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is this faith? What is the faith? The faith that we are to come to because we're going to be unified but in what in what way what's going to unify the brethren at the end of the world that the holy spirit can be poured out without measure 
what is the faith? And so we're just going to take a few examples from the Bible. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 16. We're going to read verse 16 and then skip down to verse 20. To verse 16 and verse 20. When we're there, amen. And it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I am crucified, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this faith, this faith, the faith, it is the faith of Jesus Christ. It's not just faith in Christ, but it's the faith of Christ. And you can look even Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, when they talk about here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, the faith. This is the faith we are to be unified in. But now, go with me now to 2 Corinthians, something very interesting. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to begin in verse 5. Because if we're of that faith, there's something that must be in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Notice what it says. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates? So then, if we are of the faith, if we are in the faith, then Christ is in us. And it's very interesting, Paul says, for us to examine ourselves to see whether or not we be in the faith. Now, this is interesting. Now, really and truly, a lot of the issues that takes place practically among us as God's people is that we do everything except for what this verse says. We examine one another. We examine what the preacher, um, about the preacher and his life. We examine um, other ministries and their life. We examine um, our brother and their lives. We examine our sisters and what they're doing. And verily, we take little time to examine ourselves. I honestly believe that 90% of the issues that separate us, if we would just stop examining each other and examine ourselves, a lot of those issues would be resolved. We would then see if we are in the faith and we can then now work on ourselves because by introspection, we shall see those beams that are glaring in our eyes, that are there, but because we're looking at somebody else, we cannot see them. But if we can see them, we can begin by God's grace with his help to remove them. We can be in the faith that Christ can be in us. But the question is, how does Christ get in us in the first place? Now we're going to go to a well-known scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. How does Christ get in us? Because to be a part of that faith, we know that Christ has to be, to be a part of the faith, of, to know if we're in the faith of Jesus, Christ is in us. So then, how does he get in us? How do we become a part of the faith of Jesus? How do we become united in the faith of Jesus? How do we get in that faith? Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men. Sorry, my mistake. Verse 19. Sorry, my mistake. Verse 19. Verse 19. We also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye be well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So we see then very clearly 
that is by taking heed or giving heed to that sure prophetic word, that is how the day star Christ arises in our heart and he arises with healing in his wings, as Malachi would say. He arises in the heart of his people as they begin to take heed to the prophetic word. If you skip down to verse 20 now, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so the words of prophecy is not the words of man. It's the words of the Holy Spirit. And remember from the first, we established that the, the unity of the faith is likened unto the outpouring of the Spirit of God by two symbols, the oil and the dew. So keep that in mind. Now, whose words does the Holy Spirit speak? Because we established earlier that there's perfect unity within the Godhead, right? So then, if there's perfect unity, it can't be different from what Jesus is saying, can't be different from what the Father is saying. But let's look, get some evidence for that. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, and we're going to begin in verse 12. John chapter 16, beginning in verse 12. When we're there, amen. Amen. And it says, I'll wait until we're there on the screen. Okay, and it says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the Holy Spirit is not going to speak his own words, but what he hear, but who does he hear it from? Verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. Who is speaking? Christ. He receives these words from Christ and then shows it unto his people. So then, the words of the Holy Spirit is the words of Christ. Notice. Go and remember, so the words of the prophet is the words of the Holy Spirit. The words of the Holy Spirit is the words of Christ. If you go to Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, you see something very interesting. So we start to bring it together and bring it, bring it to, together, all of these scriptures together. Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. It says, in verse 43, we wait until... And they're on the screen. It says, To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. All the prophets witness of Christ. The words of the prophet is all a testimony, if I may say, of Jesus Christ. So in the talk about the faith of Jesus, it's the words, it's we know that we're in the faith because Christ should be in us. And Christ gets in us by taking heed to the sure word of prophecy. The prophet's words is the words of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's words is the words of Christ. All the Bible, because when we took, when we went to Luke, we saw that God, Christ, took them to Moses, the first five books, the prophets, then took them through the Psalms and gave them a Bible study upon all the prophecies concerning himself. It is truly a fact to say that the faith of Jesus is in fact the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. We can then say that the faith of Jesus is in fact the testimony of Jesus Christ and being united in this testimony, being united in the prophetic word and in prophetic understanding, we can then be united as a people. So there's no unity outside the truth. Unity is gained within the truth, through the truth. Sanctification happens through the truth, through the word of God. All right? Now, to bring this to a close, we're going to go through a few Old Testament prophecies um, that 
shows that indeed this unity will be achieved by the people of God. And that that time we will see very clearly that the Holy Spirit will be poured out. That indeed it is in the final gathering in earth history. So let us go through these few scriptures. Beginning in Isaiah chapter 11. So Isaiah chapter 11 beginning in verse 13. Isaiah chapter 11 beginning in verse 13. When we're there, amen. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 13. And it says, amen. so it says, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Now, I'm sure some of, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with the principle of Judah applying to independent ministries and Ephraim applying to um, the mainline ministries. I'm not sure if everybody is, but we cannot get into that now. If a validation of that fact is needed, I can supply it towards the end. But when this unity within God's people is met, notice what takes place. Verse 14, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistine towards the west. They shall spoil them in the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom, Aaron, Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Wait a second. They're going to lay their hand upon Edom, Moab, and Ammon. But whose hand were they in before this should take place? In Daniel chapter 11, Verse 41, we see that the papacy stretches out his hand and he stretches out that hand. And that shows us that send the law being passed in the United States of America. But these entities, these very same entities, Edom, Moab, and Ammon escapes out of his hand. Why do they escape? How do they escape? Because God's people when that envy is gone, when they're in full unity, can now stretch out their hand, their power, which of course is not their own, but it's God's power, but God acting through them and snatch them as brands from the fire, as Job, that Job, that gentleman there in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah was rushed out and hurried out of that city. Lot was hurried out of that city. Even so, they can be hurried out of the doomed churches before it is too late. Even so, when that envy is gone, this is a promise that finally the missionary efforts will spring up and bear seeds. Edom, Moab, and Ammon, tribe after tribe, comes in when companies after company is sifted out. But notice also, and amen, it's a fulfillment of Revelation 18. Glad we've seen that. In verse 15, and the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian, Egyptian world or worldly, sea, nations, peoples, multitudes, and tongues. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over Trisha. So we've seen the promises of God that indeed, in the time when Edom, Moab, and Ammon are coming out, when that call to come out of Babylon is given, at that time, the envy of Ephraim and Judah, they are gone. And they won't be vexing or envying one another anymore. The infightings are gone. And God's people are in one accord. Notice another promise. Let's look at another promise. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52, beginning in verse 7. Isaiah chapter 52, beginning in verse 7. Go on there. Amen. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that said unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchman shall lift up the voice and the voice together shall they sing for they shall see 
I too, I, when the Lord shall bring again Zion, and I would say, gather Zion. He gathers his people again, and in that final gathering, they are seen eye to high. Hence, that tidings, that tidings of good news, and I would suggest to you that is a tidings from the east and from the north. It is being published upon the mountains, upon the churches, and they are seen eye to eye. Verse 9, break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He had redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his old arm in the eyes of all the nations, and the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of their God. The party, the party, go ye out from thence. Wait, what is that? What's that? The party, the party. What is that repeat phrase? It is showing that either this is referring to the second or the fourth angel's message time period. And I will suggest to you once again, can I validate it now with the time? It is the fourth angel's message. Come out of her, my people. Go you out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. That's what Paul says. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your way reward. Final promise, and we're finished. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And we're there. Amen. We're going to begin in verse 12. Now, we're familiar with it. Very famous scripture where Ezekiel see the valley of their dry bones. God let him know this is the whole house of Israel. And God commanded two specific things to happen that he prophesied unto them. And then the breath comes into them from the four winds. Again, that prophetic word entered. And then the breath enters after there's an increase in knowledge and then there is the outpouring the full outpouring of the spirit again that pattern of the dew that doctrine small rain and then then comes a full outpouring of the rain but notice again the unity as we're going to read it's a bit lengthy but after this we're finished so let's read it Verse 12, there pro therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the hosts of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall be one in thy hand. No more two. No more varying factions, warring factions. One. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Will thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks wherein thou writest shall be in thine hand before thine eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they have gone, and will gather them again, the gathering coming out on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I'll make them one nation in the land of the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Neither shall they divide themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with 
any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. Now we have to ask the question, was this fulfilled in the Jewish dispensation? No, they are the Samaritans and the Jews towards the end. The Samaritans were always left out and the Jews were eventually destroyed. This is fulfilled in the Christian dispensation. Notice as we continue. And my David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. And that brings to mind. In the book of Revelation, when it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them. He shall dwell with them. No more tears. No more crying nor sighing. He shall wipe away their tears. And so, if truly it is a fact and it's established by the Bible, that unity will then happen again. When the Lord is gathering his people, and we are in the final gathering, and that unity, God has given us this great increase of knowledge. Think about all that increase of knowledge that came in from 1989, from the collapse of the Soviet Union until the time period of September 11, 2001. That great increase in knowledge will start to go back to the charts. All of that knowledge he has given us so that not for us to boast and for self-aggrandizement, not for us to say, well, we know more than those people. No, it is for the unity of the faith that we may be established, that we are henceforth no more children being tossed to and fro by the various winds of doctrine blowing through Adventism. But we can be established in the unity of the faith. So we will end there for today. And I will hand back over to the moderator. Thank you guys so much for your time. Hallelujah, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Sister Narmalin. Yes. I don't know why you went ahead, but I could have taken up my songbook and Bible and gone home after health focus. <laughs> but them have this thing on, on um, YouTube videos that way. If you stick out until the end, what and what you'll get. I don't know about that, but for this. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Brethren, mm, this is a wonderful amen. time to be alive. Amen, amen, sister. <laughs> God, beautiful. Wonderful time to be alive. Sir, may the peace of God continue to rest and abide and stay always with you and your family and all those who you come across. May the Lord allow your shadow to allow them to understand that there is something about you that has to do with him and it's nothing about you so i am wow to god be the glory to god be the glory this has been a blessing and a half with more brata on it and I'm so grateful, so, so, so grateful. And at the same time, at nervous in the beginning to be sitting in the seat I am, but I am saying to God be the glory. I'll be having lunch and still having more of this lunch. Anybody else will enjoy this lunch again, that it won't be insipid. And I repeat, when you watch it again on YouTube, I hope so. I hope so. I want to thank. Yes, sister. Yes, yes. I want to gratefully thank. And this is when you say you hide behind the cross and the Lord takes the rain. You are just on a banana peel. 
sliding away in God. Sliding away in God. I am grateful and I'm thankful that the vessel was available. Sorry. The vessel was available and that the Lord could have used you, sir, to do that which you couldn't have done and even if you wanted to with all the intellect of you you couldn't have had to be the holy spirit doing so with that said we're now gonna break for lunch and um i think i want to do the benediction at this time brother mario is on for the benediction yes sir he did intro okay good no problem. So, can we all bow our heads? Sister Shashoy in lesser study was melted to see God in another way. I just heard it in her voice and as she prayed. So as we pray now, I want us to picture our, our hero, our to know that we are being formed and at the end of the day we are going to be fully and completely in the image and likeness of Christ because the, the end result is Christ in us, the hope of glory. So let us pray, bow our heads if you can, can't kneel, kneel if you can and if it was in another place for me I would be on my belly. I'm telling you, let us pray. Father, and we say, Father, because we are your children today. We have come because you bid us come. It is not of us that we give praise because of who we are, but it's because of you and it's in spite of us that you choose to do with us as you choose. And mighty God today, I know that you are preparing a people for your kingdom when you come, that you can be king over us all. I thank you for humility. I thank you mighty God that as you said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. I pray that we will tabernacle with you that in due time we will see the end result of you molding us mighty god i thank you for today and i'm in awe continually of who you are and i just continue that you would help each home on this platform and especially the children that are coming up that they will be groomed to stand for you fashioned to stand for you and at the end of the day don't care how small they are mighty God whenever they would come upon anyone that would want to defend their position of what you are not that they will stand boldly and that through them your Holy Spirit would help them to stand for you to say who you are because the war that was in heaven was not a normal war and that war continues today and it will end when you take your throne Jesus with your subjects and so today we want to thank you that as you write upon our hearts and minds and that as you continue to lead us that we will willingly follow where you would lead thank you for every item that was done today thank you for every the the the, the every home that is represented and everything that however each person you sat with them and they with you and you help them to put together what you wanted to be done is like a secretary taking notes hallelujah and that at the end of the day we can say it was good for us very good for us to have been here to hear what you have said to us today through this lump of clay that you are still fashioning 
And Father, as we go to receive and participate, partaking of that which you have provided, we thank you that you'll keep these words still dangling in the back of our hearts, minds, conscious and subconsciousness. And that it will be the conversation from here and forward. Continue to take full charge. Full charge. Take the steering wheel. Steer today toward you. And as we humbly look to you today, we give you praise. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have you anything? Bless you. Have you anything else to say, sir, before we break? We resume right. at... Yes, Sister Angie. Yes, sir. You're welcome. All right. Let me just, first of all, thank you for holding the fourth for us this morning as our host and uh, <clears throat> all the others who participate in the program. Sister Shoy, Sister Shreese, and everybody else. All right. Thank you. We take a break now for lunch. Hope you have a good lunch and we get back at three for five o'clock. We continue from last night. But just before we go, let me say a big thank you to Brother Matthew. I felt like I sat at the feet of a professor today, and was taught in the word, and was truly blessed by the presentation. And God bless you, brother. Continue to study his word so that you can make it plain for his people. Thank you. Um, Amen. I thank um, Brother Marvin as well. Brother Marvin was down for today, but must have been inspired to pass it over. <clears throat> right, Elder Marvin? <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. So um, let me, one last thing, Sister Angie, before we break for lunch. We have, a couple of weeks ago, we made a promotion uh, on trying to garner some funds to assist with the mission in Uganda. Now, brethren, after we listen to a message like this, how God is preparing to gather his people all over the world, not just here at CFMI, not just in Jamaica and Aruba and the US, but he has a lot of people in those heathen lands of Africa, including Uganda. And uh, some of our brethren have gone ahead and done some work there, and we want to place our hand in this effort. Uh, one or two of us have already submitted our pledges to the treasury at CFMI towards Uganda. The Ugandan money works nothing. Um, 1,000 US dollars, millions of dollars in Uganda. Okay, whatever it is that you have, even if it's 20 US, send it. We will gather that funds, Elder Nelson, in a couple of weeks' time, we will have Pastor Sankey preaching here on this platform. We would love if at that time we can say to him, we are helping in Uganda. And here is what our brethren have put together. Take this and send to the brethren. And uh, we are praying that they will build up the work. So without any compunction or compulsion, brethren, the Lord has placed on your heart to assist with the work here in Uganda. Talk to Elder Nelson, Sister Lee, um, or any one of us uh, about how you want to send in your, your pledges so that we can gather it together and send it off. Time is not long. Uh, we have little time working with, and whatever we can do for the Lord now, let us come up with the help of the Lord. God bless you. See you later. Blessings, everyone. Have a good lunch. Bon appetit. Bye for now, family. <laughs>